emails already people saying, I didn't register, can I get in? So I need to take care of them. But I wanna go ahead and get us started. Thank you all for joining us. Um, today we have Mr. Dan Mack with the Arkansas State Police Crimes Against Children's Unit Child Abuse Hotline. He is the administrator for the hotline. And a few weeks ago, he did a presentation for us on child abuse reporting. And in that conversation, he mentioned that Ed Neglect was one of the issues that, that they have on their end and they see schools struggling with it. So this, this session came up as part of that training. And so I was really glad he was able to jump on and do another session with us very quickly. But um, just so a few housekeeping things. My name is Suzanne Jones. I'm the Safe Schools Coordinator here at the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'm hosting some of these hour long webinars throughout the week just to help get some information out and try to address some issues that can help teachers and help educators in the schools. And so look for more of these throughout the summer and then again in the fall and spring, we'll keep doing these. Um, just a few housekeeping things. If you received the link for today from anyone other than myself or from ESC Works, I need you to send me an email, well, if you want credit for attending, if you need the certificate, I need you to send me an email so that I know who you are and I can get your, your certificate to you. If you got the link directly from me, or if you got it through an ESC Works email, you're fine. You're, on, you're registered and everything's okay. It's just if it happened to get forwarded around, then I need to know who's, who's watching. Also, if some of you have um, grouped up in a room and are all watching together under one person's login, perfectly fine. Just whoever is logged in, whose ever name is on the screen, if you would please send me an email and let me know who is in your room so I can give everyone credit and I'll make sure that everyone gets a certificate for today. Um, we are recording this session and it will be posted on the, the DESE trainings page. I will put that in the chat, a link for that in the chat, along with my email address if you need to email me. Um, and you'll find this information posted, give me about a week or so to get everything up and get the certificates turned around. Um, if you want to be on my mailing list to know what trainings are coming up, you can see them on the web page, but you can also get on my mailing list. I send out a message a couple times a month. And so I will put that in the chat as well. And also I will put in a link for a Google evaluation. If you don't mind to please just take that, that quick six, six question evaluation for me. Um, we're using it to help drive what other sessions we need to host and also to give feedback to our presenters. So look for those links in the chat. On that note, the chat is only going to be where we can communicate with you. So you can watch the chat for those messages, but you will not be able to use it back to communicate with us. What you will see is a Q&A button and it should be along the bottom part of your screen. So look for the Q&A. You can submit questions as we go along. Mr. Mack is really good to answer those questions and make sure he's clarified any points before we move on. Last time our session actually ran to an hour and a half because he spent extra time afterwards making sure he answered everyone's questions. So today, if at the hour mark, you need to split off and go ahead and, and get on with your day, that's perfectly fine. You'll still get the hour's worth of credit. If we do happen to run over um, answering questions and you stick with us, um, I hope we're, we're not gonna go more than maybe an hour and a half, but if we go into a, an overtime with Q&A sessions and you hang out with us, um, I'll adjust those certificates and you'll get the hour and a half credit. So be sure and use the Q&A to give us any questions uh, for him to answer. I believe that is all of my information. I'm gonna pop it again, those links into the chat. Please look for that. And then Mr. Mack, we're so appreciative to have you with us again today. And thank you for being here. No problem. Uh, glad to help anytime. Greetings everybody from uh, Safe Police Headquarters here in Little Rock. Uh, this is where the hotline is located. Uh, so um, it's, it's pretty easy for me to go out to uh, any corner of the state really to do in-person trainings which is my preference, but when addressing a general topic such as educational neglect, it really affects everybody. Uh, this is you know, the best form and format to, to really go through. Um, I don't have a, a, a slide presentation or a PowerPoint to, to present. I just have a couple of Word documents that I just kind of typed in some bullet points. Uh, a lot of questions that people have asked me, what's needed, what's not needed, and hopefully this will help clarify some of the information. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, you should be seeing on your screen, uh, just a, at the top, reporting educational neglect, what to include, and then today's date. Um, so just a, or this is just a straight bullet point type of a presentation. If you have questions, drop them in the Q&A, and then Suzanne can go ahead and filter your questions onto me, and we can go ahead and get them answered um, as, they, uh, as they appear. Um, 
So according to the Arkansas state law, educational neglect only pertains to children who are between the ages of six to 17 years of age. If a child is five or younger or 18 or older, they're outside the age requirements of educational neglect. So um, if you just happen to notice that when you, you type in your uh, key in the form on the, the fax form and you happen to notice your child is five, that will be one of the, the reasons that the report will not be accepted for educational neglect. Typically, you're looking at children who are in pre-K and kindergarten. If you're only alleging educational neglect and you report it by fax, then you only need to include the information noted in Act 554. Act 554 came out in the 2019 uh, legislative session, and it was really geared towards um, focusing on educational neglect as it would be provided uh, or presented by a, uh, an educator. Um, too many times people would just say they'd see a child randomly out and about, and they would call in educational neglect because the child was obviously missing school. They may not know the child's um, um, school days, may not know the calendar, maybe there was an in-service, maybe there was a holiday they weren't familiar with. So uh, those were being reported and being accepted and was wasting a lot of the, uh, the investigator time. So this was geared more towards educators since they would be the first ones that would primarily know um, if a child was truly being um, educated, uh, neglected educationally. So first and foremost, as a hotline, we're looking to see if the child is enrolled in school. Um, we want them enrolled in school, ready for the school year, or if they're not enrolled in school, have they been lawfully um, registered to homeschool? Those are the two criteria that we'll automatically look for. Uh, I know at the beginning of the school year, it may take a week or two for, for kids to get enrolled. Uh, maybe they're new to the district and they're, they're trying to get the paperwork in through there. So generally by that third week, the hotline starts looking at uh, enrollment issues and, and look into accept reports of educational neglect around that time. If the child is enrolled in school, then we, we look to a second um, grouping of, of requirements that we have to have. Um, this has been an extremely um, frustrating year coupled with COVID. So now you have students who are in person, you have students who are attending virtually. Last year when school shut down in, in mid-March, it was almost that everybody went virtual right away. Um, the law does not address um, virtual attendance. There was nowhere, um, it never got into the to 2019 legislative session. And from what I can see, it's not gonna be addressed in the 2021 legislative session that we're currently going through. So we try to work with the, the schools as much as we can. Sometimes those questions are best asked uh, in person over the phone as opposed to trying to communicate via fax. So the bullet points that we look at, um, if a child is enrolled in school, is that one, the parent or custodian is causing the child to be absent from school by his or her act or omission. Um, they're, they're sleeping, they're, they're, maybe they're, they're a substance um, abuser, so they're either high or they're, they're, they're intoxicated, they're passed out, they're, they're sleeping and they're not getting the child up to go to school, either to take him to school or get him to the school bus. Uh, maybe they're keeping the child home to care for younger siblings while the, the parent goes to work or, or, or sleeps during the day. So those are certain situ situations where they're intentionally keeping the child from attending the school year or from going to school. We also need to know that the absences were not caused by the refusal of the child to attend school. If the child refuses to attend school, that is a truancy issue. They are willfully not willing to go to school in person or log in. They refuse to log in. Um, some schools will get creative and, and say that the student is an elementary student and is not of age to cause themselves to be absent from school. Yes, they are. They can tell the parent they don't want to go to school and more likely mom and dad are going to permit them to stay at home. So that is them refusing. The other issue that we may have, especially with virtual attendance, is some of these children may be a little bit older. Maybe they're, they're 12, 13 and older and the parents are letting them stay at home by, by themselves. They're gonna be, or they can say that the child is in their room and the child will say, I'm, I'm gonna go log into my school uh, and do my work and the parent doesn't check on them. So again, that part is not addressed in the law. So we have to know that the parent is actually causing the child to miss school and then secondly, it's not because a child is refusing to attend school or log in to do their assignments. 
Another issue, another bullet point that we have to look for is that the absences are habitual and they're without justification. Um, the um, legal department has determined that COVID is a justifiable reason to keep a child from school or a child who is maybe medically fragile and can be susceptible to a, um, a bad reaction should they get COVID. So they can be kept home and, and not have to go to in-person attendance. I know sometimes that creates a problem if the child is not really successful academically in person, uh, virtual attendance isn't really going to suit them very well. But legally, the parent does have a right to keep their child home if they're saying they want to do virtual attendance. So we, we have to know that the, the absences are habitual and without justification. Uh, one thing to note that when you are documenting the, that the absences are habitual and without justification, you, you, you don't want to additionally say, well, the child is, is missing because of doctor's um, medical appointments or they've been sick. Um, those are justifiable. So you can't say yes, that they are uh, being absent habitually and without justification, but then come back in your documentation of your narrative and your facts and say that no, um, they are missing because of medical excuses. And then the fourth bullet point that is, is important is to include is that the absences are having a negative impact on a child's school performance. If you have a, a straight A student and the, the parents decide to reward them and, and take them out of school for a week, maybe to Disney World, um, that may be that they've met all the other bullet points ahead of time, but what is it doing to their academic performance? So if they're being negatively impacted by their absences, that would be the fourth bullet point that we're looking for to accept it for investigation, for at least educational neglect. So the first and foremost, are the kids enrolled in school or are they being homeschooled? If either one of those is no, then we can accept it for educational neglect. If the answer to those questions is yes, then you drop down to this second paragraph here, paragraph after the, uh, the or, then we have to have all four of these notes being met. The parent or guardian is um, causing the child to be absent from school. The absences are not caused by the child willingly staying and refusing to go to school. The absences are habitual and without justification. And finally, the absences have had a negative impact on the child's school performance. Some items that we want to include if you're faxing in a report to the hotline. Mr. Um, Mack, before you go on, we've got a couple about those bullet points. A couple sure. questions. Um, for clarification, what age can a child say, I don't want to go and it not be educational neglect? For instance, if a six-year-old says they don't want to go. Well, there is no age in the law. It just says that it's not due to the child refusing to go to school. Now, I think from for reasonable circumstances, most parents may, may permit that once or twice. But if it's an ongoing situation, it's something that they're doing every single week and the child is missing, and it's going on and on. The numbers are, are increasing from two absences to five absences to 10 to 20 absences, and they're occurring like that, then I would say that's enough to say that's educational neglect. Unfortunately, the, the numbers don't really jump in there to say, this is the age a child can refuse to go to school. The child may just say, I don't wanna to go to school today. And the parent may just say, okay, well, we'll let you go ahead and stay home. So we're looking for the habitual and uh, ha habitual aspect of how many times does this occur? Um, and then if a child should be enrolled and is not, how can this be addressed through the hotline? So we're looking at situations where um, if the child's living in the district, they need to be enrolled in school. If they're new to the district, what's causing them not to be enrolled? Um, are they waiting on some paperwork? Um, is there an issue with um, maybe, the, maybe the guardian or the custodian doesn't have the, the legal rights to enroll them or register them in school, that might be a consideration. Uh, we need to kind of maybe ask why. If we know that they've been in the district for a couple of weeks and they just haven't enrolled in school and there's been no request for records, then that should be enough to accept it for educational neglect. And when a young K through two student is chronically absent, how can that not be caused by the parent? If they can't transport themselves, you know, how are they, um, how can we prove that the absences were caused by the parent at that young age? So I, I missed the first part. If, if a young what student? 
K through two, kindergarten through second grade? Um, then that part you you would that again common sense could come into play. Say they they have to get themselves to school. So what we're wanting to do is figure out you know from an age standpoint, as long as they're six years of age or older, um, how often are these absences occurring? Uh, what's the reasoning for the absences that the parents are providing? Um, some of those that information isn't always known, and that's the problem that we're having with virtual attendance is that there may be an initial communication. Um, two-way communication going between the school and the parents. And then after a while, that, that communication breaks down. They're, they're no longer replying to emails. They're not answering their, their, their phones. Um, maybe they're not, um, they're not answering their, their door. Maybe the SRO is going to the school or the counselor is going to the, excuse me, the SRO is going to the home or the counselor is going to, uh, to do a home visit and there's no one there and no one's responding. So the, the I don't know part of it is what we kind of have to figure out and then we have to know. If mom or dad keep making up excuses and making up excuses, it just depends what they're saying. If they say the child has been sick, if the child's had a doctor appointment, if they're, if they're going um, to this appointment for this type of therapy or something else, um, then the school's gonna want documentation for that, th those absences. The documentation part really goes into the school aspect of it. It doesn't come into the hotline aspect of it. The parents are saying they're taking the child to the doctor, that is a justifiable, um, reason for the child not to attend school. How does the truancy versus parental neglect apply to a student with a significant cognitive, cognitive disability? Students with a below average IQ that cannot be held accountable for decisions or refusals regarding school attendance. It's kind of getting, um, that's a hard one because you've got a, a child who may be uh, maybe 14, 15 years of you know, years of age and says, I don't want to go to school and the parent permits that to, to, to go on. So it, it becomes a situation of it's not educational neglect, but in the same right, you have a child who's not going and it's, it's a truancy issue. Um, Finn's petitions can always be um, submitted, but it's not, a, it's not a very quick response or quick turnaround in that part of it. Um, working with the, with the families uh, hopefully at a, at a younger age to try to, to curb this type of um, behavior uh, might help on the, on the early onset of it. Um, sometimes in the, in the back end of it, when they're older, especially when they get to be the teenage years and they're flat out refusing, then we would need documentation from the, the medical staff or from um, counselors or therapists that say, this child cognitively isn't able to make those kind of decisions for him or herself. If that information is included, that helps us make the decision that the parent is being neglectful. Sometimes we have that information and we don't know that there's a, um, a developmental delay with the child or that maybe the child is having cognitive delays. And it just says, we go by the age, the child's refusing to attend school and the parents aren't making it. So that would fall into the, to the truancy issue. Um, and, and the questions just keep popping into the chat. And, and I think they're more about deciding um, when to report rather than the actual reporting aspect. So do you still want to handle those now before you move into the next part of your um, presentation? Do you want to move on? And, and Why don't we move on just to this next page and we'll, maybe we'll answer some of the questions that are in the Q&A. Okay. Um, and now that you're moving into the reporting part, I forgot to mention this in the beginning. So for all of y'all that are listening, what Mr. Mack is gonna to share today is the requirements of what needs to be submitted to the hotline. Your administration may still need you to gather up additional information, to build a file, to keep documentation there at the local district. What we're trying to clarify is the difference between what is needed for a file or needed by the district versus what is needed or should be submitted to the hotline. So please keep that distinction in mind. Okay, so most of you are familiar and you utilize the, the mandated reporter form that's online. So I'm, I'm gonna reference that, that document and then after this is done, I'll, I'll bring up a, a document that I filled out with just the information that we're needed for educational work. Um, at the top of the, the document is the reporter information. So as the reporter, your name is required. If you don't provide your name and all you do is provide your school, your title, your, your contact information without a name, that tells us you want to remain anonymous. 
if you provide your name with your title and your school and your contact information, but right off to the margin, you wish to remain anonymous to the family, then you will be keyed as an anonymous reporter. We can't receive a mandated reporter form and not have a name on it or have a, a request to remain anonymous. So that's the part that we always have to have. If you include your name, title and school, your address and contact phone number, and most importantly, your fax number, we will reply back to you with a report disposition, letting you know whether your report is gonna be accepted for investigation or just documented in our system. Omitting any of this information could exclude you from a fax reply concerning the disposition of your report. So your report should always include, or your narrative should include the name and age of the victim child or the children that you're reporting. Um, if they're all in the same family, then you can have all of those uh, individuals listed in, in one report. Um, you'd want to document the number of unexcused absences. Um, you'd also want to list the reason for the absences if they're known, if the parents are providing you that documentation. And then the impact those absences are having on the, uh, the child's academic performance. So you take the, the requirements in Act 554 if they're enrolled, and you just put those bullet points in, the, in a simple paragraph. And that's all the, the documentation that we really need to, to whether or not we need to accept the report for investigation or just document it in our system. Um, please be careful that your narrative does not include statements that would contradict one of the needed bullet points in Act 554. I mentioned it earlier, if you're saying the child has 25 unexcused absences, but 20 of them are due to medical reasons, those would be justifiable reasons for missing school. So um, that's the part that we're, we're trying to say. Some folks will include those kind of statements in their narratives when they're faxing in a report. It is permissible to include a checklist of the requirements listed in Act 554. Just be sure that all the items are covered. And those are the four bullet points that we address in, in the, the page above. Um, there should only be one family per fax. Um, we, we received um, several times, uh, one instance in particular where we had 76 pages of fax documentation, but only five students were listed. Um, so part of the problem was just way too much information received, but then there were five separate children involved in, in one fax. So due to confidentiality, we have to reply back to you per family. Um, because you're at a school and most often school fax machines are generally in a, in a somewhat public area, maybe a school office where other, um, other individuals might see it's on a private, we'll only put the, the initials of the, the victim child, the first and, and last initial of that victim child, saying that this is the report that you received pertaining to this individual and the disposition of that report. Um, so if, if long as everyone lives in the same household, Maybe they're siblings and all, all the siblings are having the same attendance issues and you can fax it in all as one, one report. Things that we should not, that don't need to be included here at the hotline in regards to um, faxing in a report. Um, please do not include copies of any letters or emails uh, attempting to contact parents, their, the correspondence that you've had with the parents. Um, you can simply just state uh, numerous attempts, or you can even maybe name the number of attempts. Five, six, seven attempts have been made to contact the parents to get uh, a, an explanation for the attendance issues and all have been uh, unresponded to. Uh, simply state the number of attempts to contact. Um, the hotline can't forward the copies of that documentation to, to the Department of Children and Family Services. So if you have a big thick folder on a child about their attendance issues, that correspondence should be given directly to the DCFS investigator from your end as opposed to the hotline. We really only need to see what's in that narrative and that's all that will go into the, um, into the, the copy of the report that the investigator will get. Uh, we don't forward the, the numerous pages of attendance records and, and medical records to the investigative staff because they're gonna come see you at the, at the school anyway, most likely um, get that information from you or request it from you then at that time. Um, we don't need copies of the child attendance records. This is probably the, the one report that we, we seem to get habitually that always lengthens a, a three or four page fax into a 10 or 15 or 20 page fax. Again, 
those are, are those reports are just too lengthy for us to to use and quite honestly it, it really eats up a lot of our paper from our, our our fax machine so again we don't forward those copies to dcfs uh, so if, if you have those and, and you're going to get a report accepted for investigation then provide that documentation the documentation to your dcfs contact uh, same thing will go through for medical records unless you're reporting medical neglect for the child uh, medical re records should also be provided to your DCFS investigator. Uh, if you are completing the mandated report or fax form by hand, um, please be sure the, the writing is legible and that the ink is dark enough to come through via fax. Um, oftentimes we receive a, a report that we, uh, we either can't read due to the penmanship or it's, it's too faint, particularly if it's written in pencil. So maybe if you, you take that uh, the, the form and then run it through the copy machine to make sure it's dark enough to read on your end, then it should be okay to fax uh, to the hotline uh, and we should be able to see it just as well. Educational neglect reports are just like any other um, uh, maltreatment report. Uh, they are required to, uh, to be completed within 45 days and they go to the differential response team at your local DCFS office. So um, they, they do have some time to, to get the investigation completed. Uh, you may not see a quick turnaround where the child, you make a report on a Monday and the child's um, back to regular attendance by Wednesday. They still have to work with the family in that regard. Um, unfortunately, the hotline uh, isn't able to provide you a, a reporter with an update or answer any questions regarding the status of a report. That all goes through the investigation unit once it's accepted and forwarded to them. Um, you should receive a fax reply form within 48 hours of your, your, the day you sent your fax, and it should tell you whether or not the fax is going to be accepted or whether or not it was documented only. And if you're concerned about educational neglect, we have a special fax form that relates just to educational neglect, and it will tell you what piece of information we were missing to accept the report for investigation. And as I mentioned earlier, virtual attendance is not specifically addressed in the child maltreatment law. So the same elements needed to fulfill Act 554 must still be known in order for educational neglect to be accepted. Suzanne, you wanna address any of those questions before we move on? Yeah, we've still, they're still coming in. Um, so what if a child refuses to go to school and refuses to do the work while they are at home? there's the, the part of the child refusing. Um, and again, that refusing to do the part at home gets into the point of what are the parents doing or not doing to ensure the child is completing the work. It'd be the same, take that same um, scenario, if the child is in school but refusing to do the work, they are still technically in school. So the school performance doesn't get affected uh, doesn't affect educational neglect. Educational neglect is really more focused on the child's attendance at school. If they're going to school in person and they refuse to submit or submit their paperwork or do any of their homework, then they'll get a zero for that that assignment. So that's the same thing. If they're at home and they're virtually, but they're refusing or they're not logging in or they're refusing to submit their their paperwork or their their assignments. It's the same thing as an in-school attendance type of a situation. Now, if you have a situation where the, um, maybe there's a technical, uh, technical issue, Wi-Fi is a problem. And we had this happen before with other schools. The school volunteered and offered to provide a, a hotspot and a, and a Chromebook to the, to the uh, parent and communicated with the parent and actually had documentation that the parent was gonna come up to the school and pick up the Chromebook, but they never did then we, could, we accepted that one for educational neglect because that was the parent willingly not bringing the child, if you will, the school to the child in the form of the Chromebook. So those, those sometimes there's a workaround to, to get the report accepted for investigation. But if a child is refusing to submit their, their virtual homework, it's the same thing as them being in school and refusing to submit their paperwork in person. And then this one, what does the, why does the age start at six and not five? We have a lot of kindergartners who need to come to school. What should we do? You know, that, that law changed from five to six, probably maybe around 07, 09. It was one of those things that they just 
deemed from a educational standpoint, kindergarten just wasn't there. They wanted to start with the sixth grade for, for lack of an explanation. That really was a, a law change. Um, so unfortunately, when the hotline, um, we have to just abide by the law. We're, we're usually not um, not tapped and asked about our, you know, our input is, well, what do you think about changing the law from five to six? That never really came across the hotline desk. That was a decision that was made, um, you know, by the attorneys who wrote the laws or the legislators who, who wrote and approved the law. So I don't know the reasoning for that. I just know that it went from five to six. And from what I understood, most of it was they're not going to address it with um, pre-K and kindergarten students. They were really looking or more focused on the first graders, you know. And then we have several asking, um, what's the difference between filing a FINS report or a child maltreatment report? What's the difference between truancy um, and neglect? So there's there's three or four kind of on that same vein. Sure, sure. Truancy is the child's willingness. In their, they have their free will to just make the decision that they don't want to go to school. I, I looked that up this, this morning and, you know, Wikipedia probably gave the best definition definition of a student having you know of their own free will just choosing and electing not to go to school and and that's really part of it the parents can say well I dropped my my teenager off at school and by first period they're they're saying well the child um, the child's not not there in school anymore so the parent is assuming the child's going to school but then the child is is plain hooky or they're 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 leaving at a, at a break period and, and they just walk off campus and they're gone. So um, that part is a truancy issue. When, when the child is just flat out refusing to attend school, that becomes a truancy issue and it goes to the FINS petition. FINS is just the family in need of services. You file that through the courts and then the courts can get involved and try to, to make meet the, the child and the parent together to see where the problem lies and then give directions so that the, the parent knows that they, they have a child who is, who is true and who is actively missing school and need to get the, the child back on course. So it brings the courts involved to that situation. DCFS gets involved with maltreatment if it's the parents refusing or the parents problem of not getting the child to school. So DCFS wants to provide that service to get the parents on track to get their child to school as opposed to having a child who is just refusing to go to school and the parents saying, okay. And that usually refers more to older kids as opposed to younger elementary students. And this kind of ties into that again. Um, the district requires that they file a FINS and a hotline report for excessive absences. And I think you mentioned once that those are, those are two different reports and maybe shouldn't both be done at the same. Can you address right. that? The FINS will go one place, they'll go to the court, the, the maltreatment report will come to us. So, you know, you can include in your documentation, and oftentimes you're going to have, it's, it's always coming down to absenteeism. If the child is flat out, we're, we're mainly concerned with the number of days this child is missed. Um, most often, schools will set a requirement that uh, maybe they're allowed 10 absences per semester before something is, is you know, reported to the hotline. Um, there is no number in the in the law. The law just says that the parents are causing the absences. It's not because the child is refusing to go to school. The absences are habitual without justification, and they're having a detrimental, negative impact on the child's academics. So that's the part that we're that really focuses on the educational neglect part of it. So if a child is is, is suffering academically and it's contributing uh, because of the absences, and that's what what we're really focused on. So FINS focuses more on the child's refusal, the parents trying to get that in line, whereas maltreatment focuses on the parents need to go ahead and do their due diligence to get the child to school. And then there's several questions around this, so I'll, I'll just pose it this way. They're asking where they can find the educational neglect form. They're also, I think they picked up on your comment that there was a special form for ed neglect and they wanted you to, to clarify that, that it is a special form. And do you prefer fax or phone calls? Okay. So um, the special form to clarify that part, that's actually a special fax reply form. That's a form that we're going to fax from the hotline to the reporter. Um, the mandated reporter form is, is online. And I used to have that website um, bookmarked. Um, it's on the state police website. I know that in the uh, Crimes Against Children Division. 
and I think it's to report abuse in Arkansas. It's I'll find that link and put it in the chat for you. Yeah, it's it's on there. It's a mandated form. I have it in one of my other PowerPoint presentations, and I can look for that and try to find that part of it. Um, what was the other question, Suzanne? Um, I think you may have, have hit it. There's not a special form just for Ed Neglect, right? It's the same form um, as other Correct. As other types of reports, okay? And right. then um, would you prefer fax or phone call? All right, so for, for educational neglect, unless the, the fax machine, the, the criteria was actually developed primarily for educators because as educators, you guys make up, you know, 70 plus percent of our mandated reports. So we know you guys are, are, are hard on it and making reports to us, but we all know about the call weights at the hotline. So that's been worked over the years to try to improve the situation. But, you know, Monday through Friday from 830 to about 334 o'clock in the afternoon, we're getting a lot of, a lot of school reporters um, making contact with us. Educational neglect is not a high priority in regards to the child being in imminent danger. There's not an immediacy to say, hey, law enforcement needs to go out here and take care of this child before they get harmed seriously. So you can use the mandated reporter form just to give us that very information. You've done your due diligence, you've made your report to the hotline. Most often when you fax something over, you're gonna get a receipt disposition that says you fax something to the hotline. Then you just wait 48 hours for the reply to come back and you have a file together. Um, while I'm thinking about it, the, the website that you can go to get the mandated reporter fax form is at www.ar.gov forward slash abuse. That's www.ar.gov forward slash abuse. So what I'll do is bring up a, 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 the copy of the mandated reporter form that I'm talking about. And this is just something that I filled out just generically to kind of give you a, a sample to go by. Um, this is the, the form that was on that website that I just gave you. And the, the gray highlighted pieces are, are what's needed at the hotline. Um, so you'd have your name in here, you'd have your, your, your agency or your school, and your, your title there, ABC Middle School forward slash school counselor. You want to provide your, your school address, and then you want to include your phone number, and most importantly, if you're going to do a fax, include your fax number. If you just put one phone number in there, we don't know if it's the phone number or the fax number. Most often it's the phone number and when we try to fax back to it, it doesn't go through. So some schools will have a, 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 a fax machine that will maybe um, you have to manually turn over to, to from phone to fax at the end of the day. Uh, some fax machines don't reply after business hours. So from maybe 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, they're on silent or in sleep mode. So we'll get a, um, a negative response at our end. So we'll, we'll make at least two to three attempts to fax to the reporter with the information that's provided in this reporting party information. Uh, did the reporter witness the incident, yes or no? And then you wanna include the, the, the child's information, their first and last name, their date of birth and their age, and the race and the sex of the child, their address, their home phone number if known, what school they go to or where they may currently be, is helpful. Uh, what's the relationship of the offender to the child? And this would be the daughter of the child. Um, there's a spot for you to answer whether or not you know if the child's in foster care or not. If there's a second victim or a sibling, that information would go down here and you'd repeat the same information. The top of this second page gives you the, the parent information. Um, so you'd have the parent's name, their race and sex, their address if it's known, and their age if it's known. Same thing with mom here. And that's the demographic information for the household. We want the victim child, siblings, and the adults living in the home, particularly the caregivers of the children. Then you come down to your, your narrative page, um, date and time of the incident, 
if it's education neglect, typically it's an ongoing situation. Where is it occurring in the home? And then you just want to answer the questions that are listed up here. Um, so a, a sample narrative that we get, Sally Doe is a 10 year old, has missed 20 days of school this semester. The absences were caused by parents act or omission, bullet point number one. The absences were not caused by the refusal of the child to attend school, bullet point number two. The absences were habitual and without justification, bullet point number three. The absences have had a negative impact on the child's academic performance, bullet point number four. This report would be accepted for educational neglect, as simple as it is. We don't need any of the, the attendance records. We don't need the medical records. Um, you know, if you want to include the number of attempts to, to contact the family that have been unsuccessful, you can do so as well. But really, in, in fact report, sometimes less is more, especially with education neglect. Once you've really caught on to these four bullet points and you've seen that that's what the, issue, the answers are, then you're done. We don't have to, you don't have to provide the, um, to the hotline, well, how do you know the parents are causing the act or omission or, or causing the absences? How do you know it's not? So as long as you say it this way, these will be accepted for investigation. Sometimes the, the, the school, the, the DCFS investigators want to know, well, what did they, what was their criteria to determine this information? And that was really up to the investigator. That has nothing to do with whether or not we can uh, accept a report for investigation from an intake standpoint. So once you get your facts sent in to us, you will get a reply fax that says the, um, the report was accepted for investigation. Um, if it was accepted, if it was not accepted for investigation, then you will receive this type of a fax um, letter to you. Um, it'll say the report did not meet requirements of Educational Act 554, and it's either because of bullet point number one or most likely bullet point number two somewhere in one of these check boxes, or all of them, depending on which ones apply, it will be checked. Or there will be an X in the box letting you know um, did the absences have a negative impact on the child's school performance. So we will send this form back to you if the report was not accepted for education neglect. This way it'll help you understand what we're looking for or what piece of the facts was omitted on your end. Then you can just refax that information to the hotline. Don't call the hotline and say, I need to add something to my report because we don't have the ability with our system to work it that way. We have too many operators um, to, to take the information. It becomes a confidentiality issue we can't confirm that you're the reporter who faxed in the, the report initially. So that's why you'd have to make a new report to include the information and you can make it by fax, that'll be fine. But this is the form you should receive should the report not be accepted for investigation. I'm gonna interject some questions here. There are several around the idea of, you know, we've made reports and either it wasn't accepted or we didn't have the information or, you know, maybe it doesn't seem like anything has come of the report or even it's it's been closed by DCFS. What they're asking, what do we do when we've made reports and it doesn't seem like it's been, um, anything's changed. You know, and that's the part from, from our standpoint, if it's been 30 to 45 days and you were notified by the hotline that, that the report was accepted for educational neglect, and you're still seeing recurring problems with the attendance, it, it hasn't been corrected, it's still an ongoing situation, then I would say make a new report after about 30 days. They have, DCFS, each investigative agency has 45 days to complete their investigation. DRs are a little bit different because they're really focused on servicing the family, getting the, the parents on track to get the child going to school to correct the problem, uh, almost immediately within the first couple of weeks. So if you've got a month going by and this is still an ongoing problem, we have an additional 10 or 15 absences, then we can make a new report. The investigative agency may not like it, but it's still the situation of it needs to be a corrected issue. So that's something that you can do. So a clarifying question came in. It is appropriate to keep making reports on the same family same child um, 
if we're not seeing them corrected within 30 to 45 days. I would say that time frame, yes. Give, give the investigator a chance to work with the family. Um, DRs are just that way. And unfortunately, um, because there's so many educators reporting this same problem, it, it's hard for the investigators, the DR unit, to get to everybody and get it all, you know, remedied quickly. So um, that's always helpful. Uh, it also will help on your end to make the report sooner than later. Uh, you'd be surprised how many reports of educational neglect we get in the second half of April and the month of May. It's almost like everyone's opening up their file folders and I've got to hurry up and make these reports to the hotline. And it's, it just is very time consuming. So it's time consuming for, for y'all to, to fax them to us, for us to key them and then to give them the DCFS. And then they all of a sudden have, um, you know, 25, 30 reports to investigate as opposed to uh, maybe 10 that they would have had maybe two or three months ago. So as the problems occur, fax them in when they go and that way you'll get them a little bit more of a head start. To, to get the problem corrected. And then another common grouping of questions um, seems to be, what if, what if something's been occurring and we're not being able to get communication back from the parent? So um, they're not communicating with us about the caused absences or they're not giving us the medical re records and um, they're not bringing us the things we're asking. A lot of that comes down to um, what the school is requiring, not necessarily what maltreatment is requiring. Um, so sometimes it's how something is worded. If it's believed the parents are causing the child to, to miss school uh, or they're not bringing the child into school, um, sometimes that, that, that will help. Um, as far as a the parent saying the child had a doctor appointment or had some other appointment and you're needing verification of the documentation, that again becomes more of a school policy issue than it does a maltreatment issue. So if the parents are telling you that the child had a doctor appointment and, and the school requires a, a, a doctor's note, that is something I'm that in. So unfortunately, it doesn't meet maltreatment requirements. It will be an issue for the school. And like I said, this is more problematic now with, with virtual attendance than it is more so with in-class or in-person attendance. I want to address a little bit of conversation that's happening through through the Q and A. Um, there's a lot of people kind of saying we need to address the law and have fifth, five, five year old age five students included. Um, so that is a common uh, thread. Um, as as far as how do you make that happen? Um, I think just encouraging you to be active in the legislative process, know who your representatives are, be mindful of the laws that that do impact educators and education. Um, and then having that voice as a, um, as a public citizen and as an educator with your, your lawmakers. Absolutely. And then um, a big question, they're all wanting to know if they're gonna get a copy of your, your handout. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll email them to you. It, it, they're pretty, they're just a little, a couple of word documents I kind of threw together. But yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and forward these to you, Suzanne, for, for distribution for you. Okay. Do you have other information? You, you want to keep uh, going with questions? I do. Um, just uh, some folks are concerned about confidentiality. And this was brought up in our last session a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is the part of the law that really says as a, as a reporter, regardless of whether you're mandated or not, if you're a private citizen, um, DHS shall not release data that would identify the person who made the report unless a court of competent jurisdiction orders the release of that information. So, you know, this used to be very problematic, you know, number of years ago, I've been doing this, since I just started my 23rd year, and it was very problematic when I first started here. And there have been several laws that have been created such as this one, and now there's penalties that if, if information, if your confidential reporter information is released, then that will be something that could be punishable um, from in a court standpoint. So if people request a copy of a report, by law, the victim and the caregiver and the offender have a legal right to a copy of their own maltreatment report. So they will get a redacted copy of their report in regards to um, what the context of the report was because of this one bullet point that they, they're not gonna get that information identifying who the reporter is. So, we try to let mandated reporters know that by law, their information is not to be given out. 
but in, as we all know, if this one particular you know teacher or counselor befriends a child and that child opens up to this person, um, you know, it, it maybe the maybe the parent realizes, oh well, they they knew that they were talking to Miss Jones as their favorite teacher or school counselor, and I know she's the one that made the report. They are not going to be told by law; they can't be told who the reporter is. So they may try to go ahead and play a game of poker with you to say, hey, I know it was you who called it in, but again, legally they can't give, they can't be given that information by the investigative agency. So that was that was all the part that I had as far as the um, the questions that people wanted to have addressed and, and um, hopefully straighten out and iron out for you what's needed and what's not needed. I, I can tell by the the comments that are coming into the Q and A that um, you're actually clarifying a lot for them. You're you're hitting on some either misconceptions or some unknown information. A couple people have asked about. Um, homeschool and GED, if parents are encouraging their kids to basically leave public education and go a different route, whether it's homeschool or GED, is that considered educational neglect? Not as long as they, if they enroll in homeschool, they've done their, their legal diligence to, to do that. Is their legal right to, to do that? Um, and they also have to be working towards their GED. And that's usually known within the, the, the school system. Uh, the hotline doesn't have records, uh, have access to records like that. Um, we wish we kind of did so we can verify for the school that um, yes or no, this child is enrolled in homeschooling and they're, they're getting their GED. We have to go basically on the information provided by you as the reporter. Um, if you know that the child has not enrolled in homeschool uh, or they're not, you know, working towards their GED, then that, that helps. And that gives us the information that, we, uh, that we're looking for. Uh, but unfortunately, um, that parents have the legal right to say whether or not they want their child to, to work at home or get their, their schooling at home. And one of the groups that we did invite to today's training is the homeschool liaison in the districts. So um, sometimes that person also has a lot of other duties. They may be the attendance clerk or some other things. But if, you're, if you have questions about whether a student is enrolled in homeschool or properly assigned to homeschool, um, find that liaison in your district and have a conversation with them. I do not believe that they are allowed to just print out a list of everyone who's signed up for homeschool and pass that out. So, um, you know, don't, don't be asking for a list of everyone who's, who's signed up for homeschool. But if you really do have a question about a specific student, then find that person in your district and have a conversation with them about that, about that student. And, and while we're on the talk, you know, the subject of enrolling children in school, we get reports a lot where the child has been dropped from enrollment. And the problem is for that to be educational neglect, it has to be what the parent has done. So if the school drops the child from enrollment, that still doesn't meet the criteria for educational neglect because the parent wasn't the one that took the child out or withdrew the child. Now, if the parent does, then that's a different story. But if the school drops the child due to enrollment, uh, from enrollment due to um, attendance issues, that does not meet the requirements for educational work. And another question on that line, it says, um, what if a student has been signed up for homeschool, then they return to public school and they've not been doing their work. So how do they know that someone who is enrolled in homeschool is actively working? And I think that may fall out of your wheelhouse. Feel free to, to answer if you want to, but we do have a homeschool office here at the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education um, they're probably on here with us and they can talk to you about the requirements around homeschool. But if you have a comment for that, go ahead. You know, we, we've never, like I said, for as long as I've been doing this, so we've never really had uh, what we always kind of nicknamed the homeschool police because we really don't know what criteria is. We know that they have to register for homeschool. We know that they have to pass probably an exam at the end of the school year, but there's, there's no set or established, if you will, criteria that says, well, the child's going to be in home at their at their their desk in their room from eight o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon, and they're going to be doing this assignment this timely and so on. So, I have friends who 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 homeschool their their own children, and and they use a, a structured type of environment for the child, but it 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 also varies from day to day. It's not the same exact structure um, segment um, every day. So. Um, that would really be something probably addressed more towards the, the homeschool liaison. So maybe they can uh, see this is kind of what the criteria is. 
and that I would be actually be curious to see what uh, what happens at the end of the school year as well with these homeschool children. That may be our next um, topic that we pull up. Like I said, we do have the homeschool office here at Desi, and they are a great um, group of three people, Anna, Josh, and Trish, and they work very closely with the homeschool population. And so if that's something that's of interest, maybe we could have them do a presentation for the general education population about what is homeschool and how is it handled and what are the rules around it. So um, Trish, Josh, and Anna, if you're listening, you may be up next. <laughs> Um, so can you reiterate on a sibling missing days as well? Do you report them individually or collectively? I would do it collectively as a, as a general rule, hotline reports are keyed by the family. So we'll typically ask you, if you, if you call us, we'll ask you, what's the last name of the child's parent or guardian? So we'll get the composition of everybody in that household. So if there are multiple children in the home with their parents, and say all of them are having the same attendance issues, that's one report, it's one family, it's one household. We have to differentiate if the children live in separate homes um, or if um, maybe, maybe the parents aren't, uh, they're not married and they don't share a child, but they each have their own child. Mom came into a relationship with her 10 year old daughter and uh, the boyfriend came into his relationship with his five year old son and they're all living together because there's no legal right of each adult to the other's child, those would be keyed as two separate reports. But that's something that the hotline will, will address with you when you make the call. You don't have to worry about the different legalities of all that. So um, yeah, if it's all one family, all one household, fax it in as one report, and then we can separate it if, if need be. And one of the questions came in, it said, did I understand correctly, the law does not address virtual school. And I think we need to clarify that, you know, at the time of COVID, a lot of schools pivoted to a virtual environment and our laws were not necessarily um, ready for that massive change in our educational structure. Right. I do think there are structures around a traditional virtual school, something like Arkansas Virtual Academy or um, some of the the traditional full-time online schools. I do think they have more guidelines and more structure, but what we've kind of talked about today is the, the public school version of now we've got kids who are doing virtual or partially virtual in the days of COVID. Am I correct on that, Mr. Mack? Right, and that, you know, again, the legislative session of 2019 is where Act 554 was created. And obviously COVID came out March of 20. So there was no virtual attendance really was pretty non-existent with the exception of maybe a snow day or an AMI day due to due to weather conditions. So when when the state was thrown into everyone was going virtual and you know you had educators learning how to do do, do Zoom education and classes and kids logging in and 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 not logging in and not doing and not submitting their work and everything that was really kind of a traumatic experience for all those involved, the hotline included. So we're, we had to get with our attorneys to, who write these laws and interpreting for say, where does virtual attendance come in with all this? And, and we're pretty much all stuck with these four bullet points that if they're enrolled in school, but they're attending virtually, then we have to know these four points. There was nothing to address um, online um, enrollment. There was nothing to address uh, well, they haven't logged in in three or four days. They're not submitting any of their homework electronically and so on. Um, they did say that, well, if it's a, if it comes down to a technology issue to where there's not hotspots available or they can't log in or there was, uh, there was faulty um, Chromebooks or whatever, then maybe we could address some of those issues and the school could provide stuff. But, you know, even at the end of last, uh, the last school year in 20, uh, there were, hotspot issues. People didn't have Wi-Fi if they lived out in the country in these rural areas. So um, yeah, the laws really never kind of even looked at this or saw this. So we're hoping that maybe there'll either be some guidelines set up in the law for the 2023 session. Um, and maybe if anything, schools will probably have to establish some type of guidelines, especially if we, uh, if we go to what we're thinking is going to be almost full attendance for the next school year where there'll still be an option for, for virtual attendance. So um, there's, there's still a lot of questions out there and we would love the law to, to address a lot of these things. It would take a lot of the, 
the guesswork, if you will, out of out of our aspect of it, our job. But unfortunately, it's just um, we're all learning this together. And we are at the the end of our scheduled hour, and we have probably twenty questions left in the chat. So. For those of you who need to drop off, feel free. Um, we can we can track your login and leave, and, and we'll worry about the certificates. I'll deal with that <laughs> the rest this week. But um, Mr. Mack, if you're up, we'll, I'll keep feeding you some more questions. Sure, I'm fine. Okay. So there's several around um, what tends to be an idea of habitual uh, tardiness. So like they're, they're late every the first 30 minutes every day because the parent has to go drop off the other kids first, or they're gone one day a month for various reasons. So habitual, consistent, um, late or tardiness or, uh, or absenteeism. So the, the example that was given to, to me by the attorneys the, the, who, again, interpret these laws is say the child's first class is, is math and they're habitually late every first period. They come in just in time for a second period. Um, and they're, they're having poor performance in their math class. That would be a habitual type of a situation that is having a negative impact on the school performance. So you will have your, your kids who are habitually tardy. Um, some of the schools will, um, will say, well, so many tardies equal X amount of absences. So if you have that kind of an, an equation, if you will, then we would still look at, okay, they've had X number of tardies, which translates into 10 or 12 different absences, then we still have to know, is this having a negative impact on a child's school performance and answer those questions in that regard. So it is kind of a, a workaround a little bit, but we still have to have all the bullet points met. There's several questions kind of along the line of, um, if we were, if we suspect our information was given to the family by the DHS investigator, is there a way to report that? I know you addressed that kind of um, earlier, but they're asking, is there a way to, to follow up on that? Sure, that would be um, the investigators, what we call the family service workers or FSWs, um, they have a supervisor. So um, the DR unit, which is who investigates educational neglect, would have a supervisor as well. So go to your, you just call your local county DHS office and ask to speak with the DCFS supervisor or the DR unit supervisor. And if they don't have one there on site, who would be the unit supervisor over that area? Some of the, the more rural counties uh, may have one DR unit that services three or four counties as opposed to a big county like Pulaski, which may have three or four unit supervisors for the DR unit. This is a unique question. Do you know if there are any services offered to family by DHS in educational neglect reports? Probably from, from what I've, I've gathered from just speaking with, with a few DR um, workers is that they, they really try to figure out where the problem is. Where, what's causing the child not to be brought to school? Is it a, is it a financial issue? Is it a transportation issue? Is it uh, you know educating the parents as far as what's needed and so on to, to get the child there and so on? So it, it's hard for us to sample to to answer that question. I would probably ask your local DR um, you know worker and ask him you know what exactly you know goes on with these. A lot of times it's just um, giving getting the parents aware that hey uh, if you don't get this corrected, this is going to go into an investigation. You don't want that. DR was created to get a quick fix to a, a very simple problem. Just, just bring your child to school and then there won't be an issue. If it continues on or the family's not willing to cooperate and work with the DR worker, then it becomes an investigation which is a little bit more involved than, than what the family may want. If they've not received information back on the, whether the report has been taken or if they want to check on the, the status, is there any way that they can check on a report that's been filed? Um, you can always call, call through the hotline, the 800 number and ask that you do that, or probably just best that you fax something to us and you wanna follow up, you know, maybe refax what you faxed and said, 
refaxing from whatever date it was originally faxed. Um, oftentimes you want to double check to make sure that what you sent us has all the contact information that you would uh, you would need, that we would need to fax it back to you. Uh, we, we receive two or three reports sometimes, but there's no fax reply number um, on the uh, on the form, or maybe the form was was blank and it just said uh, the edu the attendance clerk at ABC Middle School. It didn't give us a name or someone to reply to. And this one, I'm not, I'm just going to read it. The county FINS offices are requiring hotlines to be made when we file a FINS, and they have not been accepted all year. Are you in conversation with the FINS contacts explaining the difficulty in accepting truancy? Okay. So we don't have direct communication with the FINS offices, but some do require, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the counties differ. They're not, it, there's not all just one overall state um, FINS kind of um, guideline, if you will. Um, so some say if you're going to do a, 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 a FINS report, a FINS petition, then you have to make a hotline report. The two are separate from one another. You, you can still fill out a FINS petition, even though the hotline did not accept the report for investigation, because a FINS would be geared more towards truancy, whereas the hotline report is going to be geared more towards the parents preventing the child from going to school. So they're actually two separate issues. We've had another um, you know, case a couple of years ago where uh, before the law changed in 2019, where um, a, a particular FINS case wasn't going to be seen if the child was, was nine years of age or younger. So those were not being, being looked at at all by anybody. So it's kind of one of those, we don't really set those guidelines. Those are separate from the child maltreatment laws that we actually adhere to. And then they're asking, um, so when a, a student says that their parents didn't wake them up to catch the bus or the parents didn't have a vehicle, at what point is it the parent's responsibility to get the kids to school or are the kids old enough to take care of themselves? So for instance, a fifth or sixth grader fifth or sixth grader um, saying their parents didn't wake them up. Are they old enough to wake themselves up? Well, and this is probably where um, as educators, you know your students best. Um, if you have a child who is a, you know, a super achiever and, and you know, his habits are he gets himself up, he gets himself ready, he does A, B, and C for himself, or is, is that child reliant on the parent doing those things? You know, in my opinion, it, that's probably the, the latter. If the parents are responsible for getting the child up and to and from school. But if there's also the situation where the parent says, you're 12 or 13 years old, you can get yourself up and so on. So the parent's still responsible for getting the child to school and getting them up and getting them ready to go catch the bus or whatever. So uh, in th that example, I would, I would still lean towards it's the parent's responsibility. And again, meet the rest of those bullet points that it's, it is, though, that would be without justification. You know, how often is it occurring? If it's at least once or twice a week, um, it's having a negative impact on a child's school, and it's the same problem. Um, you know, they couldn't get transportation. They, uh, um, the, um, you know, they couldn't, they didn't, no one woke them up, or the, the parents slept, or, you know, these kids have to get somewhere. They have to be driven to the school bus, or they have to be driven to school. That's still the parent's responsibility. And this was a, a comment just to confirm, if a student is habitually absent, parent is taking them on trips out of town, they're, they're gone to do fun things, the parent is actually pulling them out of school, but they keep their grades up, there's, they're making up their work, there's, there's really no educational impact to it. That is not a hotline call and there's nothing to, to do to address the absences not from a maltreatment standpoint. Now for school policy, that could be an issue that you may have guidelines established, but for if they're enrolled in school, then we have to know that the absences are having a negative impact on the child's school performance. That one line was really put in there to say, again, this is outside the box. This is what people were thinking. Well, what's the harm if the child takes a week off of school for rewards of good grades? So it's, yes, they're missing school. Yes, it was caused by the parent. 
it's not caused by the child refusing to go to school, but there is no negative, there isn't a negative impact uh, or no impact to the child's school performance. So that's the aspect that they really wanted to look at for it to be maltreatment. Or, or this law was geared towards the kids who are in trouble academically more so than the kids who are who are missing and they're still doing okay with their grades and everything. We are legally required to drop a student if they have 10 consecutive absences. If the student continues to not show up and does not enroll in another school district, would a hotline call be acceptable? The, the problem I would have with a child not being enrolled in school, um, too many times, again, we fall in that situation where that wasn't the parent's um, act or omission. That was a school policy that drops them from the school. Um, so they were enrolled, but then dropped. So that's the part that we've been told that it's not a hotline issue if they've been dropped. Now, if they move and they go to a different state and they don't enroll, that's something different. But if they're enrolled in school and they're dropped, then um, that becomes more of the school issue, more of a truancy part of it. And then there's a couple questions about like truancy officers work with um, older kids. There's graduation credits that have to be earned that, that get the older kids to school, but the younger students kind of get lost in the system. Are there any preventions in place or help for younger students? You know, that's a hard one because it, each individual school is different. Um, for us, we're, we're looking at the black and white of what's on the screen. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to sit, figure out why these kids are missing, um, missing school, how it's affecting their, their, uh, their school performance and their grades. So um, we don't at the hotline, that may be something more that your each individual school would reach out to the, um, to maybe the DR unit workers from DHS and see if they have any kind of suggestions for that, especially for the younger ones. Um, is there a point as the school year ends that we should stop reporting? Well, if, if you're looking at educational neglect, at the very least you, you got your report accepted uh, or at least you got it reported and documented into, into our system. Just know that, you know, we're at the point now where school's gonna be over in, in less than two weeks for, for most of the state. So if the unit has 45 days to come to completion of their investigation, there, there's not a whole lot they can do now. So these reports are always better uh, reported earlier than later. Um, waiting to, to, the, to the first of May is just kind of hard for a lot of things to correct itself because now they're going to say, well, we're at the end of the school year and, and there, there won't be an issue that they can see after, after Memorial Day. So um, you can always get the information documented in our system. How DR kind of handles it and can, makes a conclusion with that, uh, you know, I won't, I won't know. Several people are asking for my contact information and your contact information. I've put mine in the chat and okay. I'm, we'll make sure yours is on your PowerPoint or you can drop it in the chat if you want to. I will. Yeah. That won't be a problem. Okay. Um, if, a young, if a young child continuously battles head loss and is sent home time after time, they're missing school. Is that a hotline issue or a FEMS issue? Uh, actually, it is a hotline issue. Environmental neglect is a concern uh, specifically that relates to, to head lice. Uh, the, the hotline looks for head lice to be something that, again, a word is habitual, something that is a chronic issue uh, for occurrences of head lice, say, in a two-month period. So what's happening is that the child is getting treated uh, on, on his or her head, but the, the home environment is not being treated. So... They may be good for a couple of weeks and they'll get it back. And they'll be good for a couple of weeks and get it back. And you do that back and forth. So about the fourth time is when we say that then it's a habitual chronic type of a situation. Or if it's such a severe case that maybe the child has scratched their head to the point of uh, causing sores on his or her said that would maybe need immediate medical attention. That would be a severe case of it. Um, so head lice concerns often lean into or lead into educational neglect reports because a child is missing habitually 
because of a head lice issue, that would not be a justifiable reason. And we still would have to know that there's a negative impact on the child's school performance due to the lack of attendance. So we really want to know what is the parent doing to correct the issue? You know, are they, you know, are they treating the home? Are they, you know, delousing the home or just the child and washing the child's hair? So two other bigger group of questions. Several of them are asking again. They're wanting you to confirm what you said earlier that if a student is, is virtual and they are not logging in and the parents aren't making them, that's not educational neglect. Not necessarily. Again, that's, that's one of those of, you know, why are they not making them? Do they know the child is not logging in? And, and oftentimes what happens is we don't know the answer to that question. Is it the child that comes to the point of the child's refusal to attend? Because they're actually attending, if you will, by logging in virtually. So if they choose not to attend or log in, that's the child's refusal. And we would want to know if you had, if you called us, we would ask you, does the parent know that the child is not logging in? Or have you communicated with the parent about absences and lack of of assignments being completed or turned in or submitted electronically. Um, most parents who, who care about their child's school performance will be very, uh, should have a good open line of communication with the school. It's sometimes unfortunate that you've got some that just don't. Parents are working and they're assuming the child's gonna do this or maybe they have a grandparent come over and, and, and sit with the child while the parents are at work but the grandparent isn't paying attention, doesn't know if the child's logging or not logging in. So the child just refused, just not. They're on their, they're at home and they're on computers playing video games instead of actually being logged into their school. I like the, the comparison you made to a student who's coming to school every day, but just not doing their work, not turning in their homework. Um, so that's a, that's a comparison I hadn't thought of. And a lot of them are asking, is there even a ballpark of the, of what is considered habitual missing. So how many days is it in a row does it have to be or how many days does it have to be? I think you have to look at the habitual part and the negative impact. So many times we, we focus on the number of absences as opposed to how is this affecting the child's school performance? And even with, um, with our DR unit, if they come back and ask me, well, the child's only missed seven days of school or may only missed you know, 10 days of school, whatever, but but look at where their grades are. Look at where they're, maybe they have a history. Maybe there's a family history. Maybe this individual child has had a problem with attendance and maybe uh, they've been held back for one or, or two, you know, two times. So it's really kind of looking at the, at the bigger picture of all of it. So if it's something that's habitual, it's an ongoing, it's a number of days and it's having a negative impact, then, then it's, that's your discretion. If you believe that's the case, then go ahead and fax in a report or call in a report. They're asking how would they know if it's the parents not getting the students there, if it's due to them oversleeping or drugs or, or not having a car, how do they know um, that the parents really aren't doing this without truly investigating it? You know, sometimes, again, how, uh, you guys know your, your students, just, a, just an open conversation. Hey, I, I missed you earlier this week, you know, everything okay, you know, do you know, and sometimes the kids will just go ahead and just start talking and they'll just, they'll just open up and start saying something. So it could just be a, a, just a casual conversation, uh, more or less than, a, than an investigation or interrogation. So uh, sometimes it's just being inquisitive. Younger kids are easier to, to get information out of than the older students. And, and sometimes that's, that's the hard part where we ask the question, do you know, and you don't know, and you can't ask, you know, the child's not given the information. So uh, it becomes almost a stalemate where we have to have the information before we accept it, but you, you're unable to, to get the information that we need. So is there anything about a student who is over 18 years of age, anything that can be done to help them? Legally, they're an adult. So they, they can choose to, to do just about anything they want to once they turn 18. Um, if they want to drop out, that's their, that's their due diligence. They can. If there's an 18-year-old who's being physically abused in, in his or her home and um, 
it's not a child maltreatment report. Even though they may be dependent to the parents, um, they have the legal right to move out of the house. They can call the police and, and press criminal charges. So it, it's a sad situation, even though they're, they're, they're still children in, in, in a lot of our eyes, legally they're an adult. And then this goes back to the logging in. Does that mean it's truancy if the child isn't logging on and the parents aren't aware? That would be more of a truancy issue, especially if the parents are aware. If we know the parents are aware, that, that leans a little bit more towards they're not, you know, they're not doing their diligence to get him or her to log into school if they're choosing to do a, a virtual assignment. So the virtual attendance is kind of an understanding that the parents will see to it that the children are, are logging in and doing their work. Um, but if the parents have no idea that they're not logging in, logging in or submitting their homework, then, um, then, then we can't hold them accountable for it. And then what about the parents who, who still don't comply with edu educational neglect and the kids are actually found to be uh, in the educational neglect? What are some of the penalties um, in your experience that you, that you have seen imposed? Well, if it goes to court and judges get involved, that's, that's usually not a good thing. This is, you know, you've seen some of the severe cases where um, it's, it's so bad with the kids' attendance and their, their lack of education and um, teenagers that are, you know, second and third graders by, a, by their academics. So when, when judges get involved and they're ordering, um, you know, parents to do stuff and, and their attendance is involved, that's, that, that's a pretty serious case. I don't know from a criminal standpoint um, if, if that's anything more that can happen. I don't know about children being removed from from a parent's care, unless the parent, him or herself, is having an issue, um, maybe there's a mental health issue, maybe there's a substance abuse problem that would lead more towards why the child is not being brought to school. So if that's the case, then sure, the, the, you know, legally the, the children will be removed from the, the parent's care due to the, the caregiving abilities, not more so than the educational neglect aspect. And then, some of them are saying that they've been told they have to drop a student or they've been told to drop a student who's missed 10 consecutive days. Is that causing a problem in the system? Are they falling through the cracks because then they're not enrolled? You know, I think so because the, again, it's not an educational requirement for our standpoint because the parent didn't, didn't withdraw them. So those are kids that need to be worked with. Maybe it becomes a FINS petition right away when that happens, if that's the case. We don't see as many of those types of situations where a child has consecutive absences, but we have seen this year where children have been dropped from enrollment and, and we don't know what happens after the fact. It's not maltreatment, but it sure would be something I would think more so from a truancy or maybe a, a FINS petition. So there's just some conversation about since it takes 45 days to, to turn the case around, um, it might still be a good idea to go ahead and report because that would be about the time they come back in August. So it might help students who are returning and sure. might have a chance to investigate over the summer. You know, at the least, it, if, if, if it's not accepted for investigation, it's still documented in our system. So if you have the, the situation continuing into August, then you can just say, this is where we left off in, in May or the last school year, and now we're here at it again in August, and we're starting out the same way. Again, give it, you know, at least the first couple of weeks of the school year um, before we actually start seeing those reports to get accepted, but it's, it's always better, again, it, you, 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 at the very least, you create a history in our system of what this child or family has done. Um, this may have been asked and answered already, but if a response is received advising that referral has been sent to DCFS, does that mean that the report has been accepted? Yes, it should say on the, uh, on the cover sheet or on the, the fax form that it was accepted. Um, I can try to pull that form up real quick and see if we can get to it. But that's just something that we would wanna let you know that it was indeed accepted for investigation. So, this is um, uh, kind of a sample of what it would look like. It would be this checkbox right up here, excuse me, this one down here. 
Referral has been sent to DCFS for DR differential response. So that these two are synonymous as far as being accepted. One is accepted for investigation. One is it, one is sent to the DR unit. So that's where educational neglect would would fall for um, for this type of a reply. And then um, this goes back to that dropping them after ten days. Um, is there a law or something? Do you know of any, Do you know if there's a statewide mandate to drop them after ten days and file a pens? I'm not aware of it. Um, again, from that's really pertains more to the educators um, portion of it. Uh, it's not written in the maltreatment laws that I'm aware of. So it might be under the educational um, statutes for, um, for educators. So, um, Melanie, you you answered that. I would be interested to know, um, is it administration? Is that I'll dig into it from an ABE side and see if there's rules or regs that that we're saying drop a student after 10 days just to see where that information is coming from. Um, so can we go back to a student being tardy? If a student is habitually tardy, isn't having, oh, it's having a negative impact on their grades and it is the parent's fault for the child always being late, would that qualify for educational neglect? Yes, as long, and that would meet all four of the bullet points. That's the, that's the part of it. You know, why were they being, why were they late? Why were they um, always tardy? Um, you know, I could get mom or dad up to drive me to school. I had to walk myself to the bus. I had to find a ride to school. Those kind of habitual, um, you know, revolving door of excuses, if you will. As long as it meets all four of these bullet points here uh, at the bottom of the screen, that's what we're looking for. And someone, thank you, Joel. Someone popped in the, the actual law and it's, uh, Arkansas Annotated Code 618.213 about attendance records um, that states they will be dropped for 10 consecutive days of um, a drop from attendance records for missing 10 consecutive days. So that's something I'll look into again for a learning experience for myself. Right. And that's the, the maltreatment laws are covered in, in a, the 1218 um, aspect of the, of the criminal codes. So the 618 would be outside of, of really what our, our scope of expertise would be. Okay. Um, let's see, two, two more. If a student is in virtual and the parent has signed a contract to be the home teacher and they sign that they are supposed to monitor and help them with their work, then would that be seen as the parent knowing they aren't logging on since they're supposed to be involved on those school days? So it sounds like there's some type of a virtual contract for kids with the parents for kids to be virtual. You know, and that's the hard aspect of it, of, of the communication lines between the school and the and the, the parent. You know, they'll say they'll sign a contract to do this just so they can homeschool the child, but then there's an accountability aspect of it. So, you know, if if they're not doing it, we, do we need to know we need to know why they're not doing it? Why, why, what happened? Did, did something happen that prevented them from, from doing it? Maybe they, they, they were kept at work or they made arrangements and their babysitter got sick or so on. So there's, again, that's an arrangement through the school more so than it is in maltreatment. So we can't say that every, really in essence, every child who's virtual, um, their parent has agreed for them to be, you know, go through virtual attendance. So, I mean, they're gonna assume that I would think that the school is going to, that the child is going to log in, they're going to do all their work and it's going to go from there. Um, are there any exceptions to the law with a student who is special ed? There's not, but I would also think that because of, of developmental issues, absences may be more impactful to the child's school performance. So you would still look at the situation. You have a, a, a developmental, uh, developmentally delayed student maybe, or, or however the term would be to say that they do require attendance. Um, they do require um, this, this, and this, and how has it negatively impacted the child's attendance? Um, I just my own thought, I would think a special ed student, if they are receiving some type of um, therapy at school, some other type of, of wrap around services, then it might, maybe it doesn't apply so much to educational neglect, then maybe it could possibly be 
um, maltreatment that they're not getting them to those services or care? It's possible. Sometimes some of the services are, are medically required. Um, so we'd have to look at that issue to see um, because medical neglect will require a, um, um, a severe kind of a situation that if left untreated could become impactful to the child's um, uh, overall well-being, um, you know, health. I, I don't have the, the definition right in front of me. So it depends on the severity of the situation and what, um, what therapies um, he or she is not receiving. And then um, someone asked about the consecutive days of school, what happens to the school? Um, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I will look into it, but I think Joel mentioned that there was, it impacted funding somehow. Um, so you can't claim funding for a student who has been absent 10 consecutive days, um, but I'll have to look into that more. Um, I think you have done a great job for us. Again, Mr. Mack, I appreciate you being here. I think we've, we've run through the, I don't know how, it, it, there's 105 questions in the chat. So I grouped a bunch of them for you. There was, wow. there was a lot of conversation around this today. And I appreciate you again, um, being with, willing to do a second recording for us. Sure. So for those of y'all who weren't able to join us last week, there is a recording that Mr. Mack did for just general reporting of child maltreatment, which tended, I think, to be more on the physical side. Was that more what that one addressed? Mm -hmm. um, that uh, recording is posted on the trainings webpage along with his handout and a QA and a document that he did for us. Um, I'm actually working and going back through that Q&A document, putting in the timestamp of the video where he addressed it to help navigate some of those questions. So um, we're building, trying to build up a resource library of, of supports for y'all. And I just I, I appreciate everyone for taking your time and being with us today. Um, those of you who've hung out for the full hour and a half, I'll adjust your certificates. Just give me time. It, it takes a while to work through all this. And you will see in the chat, again, the things that I popped in. My email address, if you need to reach out and let me know um, that you were here, if you weren't registered or if there were multiple people in your room, there's the web page where you can find the, the upcoming trainings and the recordings of the past trainings. There is the link to an evaluation. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And then uh, the, the link to sign up for the mailing list if you wanna know, get emails about our upcoming trainings. And we'll make sure that Mr. Mack's information is included um, on his PowerPoint, his presentation as well, so you can reach out to him. Any final words, Dan? No, um, if you have questions, feel free to, to shoot me an email or, or call me. Um, I'm, I'm in and out of the office doing a lot of these trainings, so email is probably the easiest uh, format to, to reach me. Uh, you can't make a report through me. That would go through the hotline or through our fax, but uh, I'll, I'll answer any question I can for you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Feel free to log off and Dan, have a great summer. Appreciate you. No problem. Take care, Suzanne. I appreciate it.